where life yeah okay uh so hello everyone so i am alice depani from cedal and i'll start by introducing professor hima so professor hima is an assistant professor at harvard university with appointments in both the business school and the department of computer science and cs so her research interests lie within the broad area of trustworthy machine learning more specifically her research spans explainable machine learning fairness adversarial robustness and reinforcement learning and also causal inference so today she will be talking about uh, machine learning for high stakes decision making uh, opportunities and challenges so thank you professor hima for agreeing to give this talk and taking time out of your busy schedule and i hope everyone enjoys it thank you great uh, thanks alish and uh, welcome everyone i'm so glad to be here with you all and thanks so much for taking the time to join i think in india it's actually night around 8:15 pm or so so thank you so much for joining uh, on an evening of a sunday uh so i think since you know we have about 45 minutes uh, without any further delay let me get into the contents of the talk uh the talk that we have today uh, i thought i could kind of keep it a bit uh, slightly high level to kind of discuss a lot of challenges and problems that we face when we are trying to design ml tools for high stakes decision making and let me start this talk by explaining what i mean by high stakes decisions I'm sure a lot of us have seen uh, these kinds of decisions in different domains. Like, for example, in healthcare, a doctor trying to figure out what treatment to recommend to a patient. Uh, in education, an instructor trying to figure out what intervention would be good for a student. For example, an extra class in math, or you know, maybe talking to a financial counselor, or you know. Uh, Uh, dealing with other issues in which case the intervention could be different so what would help a student perform better and graduate their classes on time and in case of law a decision that a judge often makes or you know one of the key decisions is regarding bail and a judge decides if a defendant should be released on bail or not right and of course there are several other decisions also which are pretty critical uh in case of uh, law and criminal justice and of course in things like business you often have these critical decisions which impact the finances of a company such as should we pursue a new sales strategy or a marketing strategy or hiring strategy and so on so these are the kinds of decisions that i'm referring to as high stakes decisions uh these decisions have impact on human well-being whether it is someone's health or whether it is someone Uh, enjoying their freedom uh, or you know things like finances of both individuals communities or companies right so these are all like as we can see these are critical decisions and making errors in these decisions is often pretty problematic so ideally we would like to avoid errors uh, as much as possible when making these kinds of decisions uh so just some background about like how these decisions are being made uh, quite a bit in today's world um as you may be aware humans are making a lot of these decisions today right uh but human decisions are often noisy and inconsistent and they are subject to a variety of conscious and unconscious biases so given this the question that uh in the last i guess 2 to 5 years people have been sort of like uh, prob probing around is can machine learning help humans in making these decisions in a more accurate and efficient way right so people have been trying to kind of nudge around and explore if machine learning can actually help us make these decisions better and why is that the case like why do we even think machine learning holds any promise in helping with these kinds of decisions one is a lot of these kinds of decisions rely on making good predictions right so for example if a judge can predict beforehand which defendant is likely to say commit new crimes when he or she is released on bail and then they'll be able to avoid releasing such people so a lot of these decisions underlying there is like a nice prediction problem or you know they kind of rely on making good predictions right so and as we all know machine learning models are of course designed for making accurate predictions that's what they are good at and beyond that there is also this advantage that machine learning models result in consistent predictions 
Well, I guess a lot of them. Uh, so if you give a data point, most likely you will see the same outcome or the same prediction each time, right? So with a lot of the machine learning models. Uh, and of course, they have this ability to learn from lots of data. So both of these are not characteristics that human decision makers possess. So these are some of the unique advantages that machine learning models give us, right? So and that's why these things hold a promise in terms of helping uh, you know, make better decisions. However, that said, I'm not arguing that machine learning models are all good and, you know, we should basically deploy them everywhere and so on. So there are some disadvantages that they have, too, that need to be fixed before we can sort of think of uh, any widespread deployment of machine learning frameworks, right? So what are these disadvantages? Of course, we all know that machine learning frameworks primarily optimize for predictive accuracy. Uh, in doing that, they do not account for some core challenges in real world decision making settings. And what are these core challenges? First one is explainability. Why do we care about this? So whenever we are thinking of deploying uh, an automated tool or a model in settings like healthcare or criminal justice and so on, like the ones we just discussed, it is important for a human to be in the loop so that the human can and know when to intervene, right? So they can intervene and say, okay, now the model decision is not correct, so let me override and make a different decision. So in order to enable that, we need the models to be somewhat understandable to the decision makers. If it's a complete black box, the human decision maker who is in the loop will never be able to know if the prediction is correct uh, how they should think about it like what logic did the model employ in reaching that prediction and so on so on the other hand if the model is interpretable or explainable and they can understand roughly what might be going on underneath the hood they can uh, decide when to intervene right so for example when the model might be using some wrong features to make a prediction then the person can be like oh i don't trust this prediction, let me go and overwrite and make my own uh, prediction for this particular person, right? So for all of that, to enable all of that, we need to make sure that there is some form of communication channel, uh, which is basically the model being more understandable to the decision makers who are in the pipeline of decision making. And the second important thing is, uh, in these kinds of settings, and I'm sure in pretty much every other real world setting you can think of, there are selection biases in the data, which in turn translate into biases and or, or discrimination or unfairness in machine learning models. Right. So how do we deal with this problem? Uh, what are some of the issues around these biases and so on? We'll also discuss more about that today. And of course, the last problem is missing counterfactuals, which means often in these kinds of decision settings, take, for example, healthcare, where a doctor is recommending a treatment to a patient. The data that you have is such that you only observe the outcome uh, for the patient for that particular treatment which the doctor has already recommended, right? So if the doctor recommends a treatment A in the data, we'll only see what happened to the patient after taking treatment A. But we don't see what would have happened had the patient been given another treatment B. Right. So that itself causes its own complexity when designing models with that kind of underlying data. And as you can see, these are, of course, like significantly important problems which we need to address before we can, you know, sort of start reliably deploying machine learning models within these kinds of decision making settings. Uh, with that said, uh, today we'll be talking about each of these challenges in detail, and I'll also be giving some overviews and intuitions about some of the basic solutions for tackling these kinds of problems, right? So first we'll start with interpretable and explainable ML, then we go to uh, data biases and what kinds of biases might occur, some common biases in practice, and how these biases can in turn cause unfairness in machine learning models, certain kinds of blind spots in machine learning models, and we'll end this talk by discussing uh, about the missing counterfactuals problem. Okay, All right, so with that said, let's go to the first topic, which is interpretable and explainable ML. So uh, if for people who haven't 
you know, heard about this topic before, uh, I'm sure your first question is, so why do we care about interpretability, right? Uh, why is it important to understand model behavior? That's because first, it is easier or it helps us to easily detect model errors and debug models. So if we see how a model is making a particular prediction, we might know that it is using the right kind of logic or not, and we could potentially detect some of the errors that the model might make because of the kind of logic that it is using. Right, So debugging and detecting errors is a critical part of why interpretability might be needed. And second thing is, uh, it helps decision makers decide if and when to trust the model's prediction. Right, So if the logic that the model is employing in making a prediction or a set of predictions is somewhat flawed, and if as a human you can kind of sense that and say, oh, the model is using all irrelevant features when making these predictions, so I should not trust the model. Right, So these kinds of decisions we can make if we understand what the model might be doing. So then, OK, so with that said, we have sort of motivated why we need interpretability. So then the next question that comes up is, so how do you facilitate interpretability? So how do you make things interpretable? So the good news is some of the simpler classes of models are already readily interpretable. Like, for example, linear classifiers, like linear regression, logistic regression, or even uh, you know simpler or like smaller decision trees and some other rule-based models, some of these are readily interpretable, right? Assuming that you know the number of features that you have in your linear model with non-zero coefficients is not like in hundreds. At the same time, you know the levels on your decision tree is not going beyond like say like five to ten and so on. Like barring some of those uh, kinds of things, these classes of models are roughly interpretable. Right. So then the question that comes up is why not just build these models? Like, why do we even care about doing anything else? Why not just build simpler models? The answer to that lies in some of your data related issues. Right. Of course, we can build simpler models. But if your data is kind of amenable to that, then these models will also be accurate. So what do I mean by that is this plot that I'm currently uh, sharing with you guys, it is uh, a plot of a data. It's a scatter plot of a data with two dimensions. On the x-axis is dimension one or feature one, and on the y-axis is feature two or dimension two. And the red colored uh, points signify a label of, say, minus one, and then the blue colored points signify the label of plus one. Right. As you can see here, these two classes can be easily separated with a linear model. Right. So they are very linearly separable. In that case, of course, if you can if you build a simpler model, that model will also be accurate because your data is kind of more amenable or it is lending itself to those kinds of models because the data the, the data is linearly separable. So simpler models and linear models can already do the job. They'll be just as accurate as maybe any other complex model that you could build. Right. On the other hand, a lot of the other real world data sets, the decision boundaries there look like what you're seeing on the right hand side of your screen. Right. So this kind of like a light pink colored shaded region. So that is what is like the uh, data's like, let's say, positive points or points labeled as plus one. And then the blue region corresponds to points labeled as minus one. So the boundaries are, as you can see, like quite nonlinear. So like having one simple linear model is not going to help us distinguish between class plus one and class minus one. Right. So in such case, if you build just one linear model, your accuracy will be terrible. So for this, you will have to start building more complex models in order to uh, come up with more accurate models. So in this case, in the case that you see on the right hand side, now the interpretability gets trickier because, uh, of course, we don't want to sacrifice accuracy too much in such cases. Uh, but when we try to come up with complex models there, say, for deep, for example, deep neural nets, then you're sort of losing interpretability, right? So then here comes the real trade-off of what to do about interpretability. Okay. So I think that has probably already given you guys some intuition about why is it hard to understand complex black boxes, uh, just to kind of clarify that and like, 
you know, summarize that, that's because our models are more and more increasingly looking like what you see on the left hand side, right? Multiple layers and activation nodes and so on. And these are getting way more complex, even for system designers to understand what's going on. Forget, you know, people like decision makers and so on who are not even familiar with machine learning. So given that we are dealing with such kinds of models more and more, then what do we do about understanding them? Right. And the second thing is, uh, which is another very important practical criteria is a lot of the models that you commonly see employed in things like, say, healthcare and so on are, are often designed by companies who make these models proprietary. So these companies, of course, for profitability and other reasons, they do not want to share their secret recipes. So often they design these black boxes and just kind of deploy them at their client sites. And in that case, clearly we do not have access to any of the internal workings of the model. And most likely the companies will not be open enough to share what the underlying models are as well, right? So how do you think about understanding uh, models in these two kinds of contexts is, actually a huge problem. All right. So given that these are the two issues that you know we are facing, what is the solution? So wherever you can build a simpler model, which is also accurate, go ahead and build it. Of course, that's like the probably the most foolproof uh, uh, technique to do to facilitate interpretability. But in cases where we don't have access to the model or like we will be sacrificing too much accuracy if we make the model interpretable, in such cases, one of the solutions is just build the complex models or take your black boxes and then explain them using simpler models, right? And these kinds of techniques, the techniques that do this are called as post hoc explanation techniques. So uh, let's start talking a little bit about these post hoc techniques. So post hoc explanation techniques are those which typically consider the complex model as a black box. They don't require any access to the internals of the model. They only require query access, which means you give a data point to the black box and it returns your prediction, right? So that's all they require. They don't need to know whether the model has a particular functional form, whether it's a deep net, linear model, or anything. They just want query access for them to be able to explain the underlying model. And uh, just to give you guys a flavor of like what the literature has so far, there are several types of post hoc explanation techniques. So for example, I guess the main bifurcation or categorization is local versus global approximations, which means local means the post hoc explanation technique is designed to explain individual predictions. Global means the post hoc explanation technique is designed to explain the complete model in its totality. Right. So that's like a main uh, sort of characterization. And of course, depending on what kinds of techniques they are using, there are gradient based versus perturbation based and so on, depending on like what is their exact methodology that they're employing. Uh, just to throw out some names there, there are a bunch of like well known uh, post hoc explanation techniques, Lime, Shap, Anchors, Muse, integrated gradients and so on. All right, so let me just give you a very quick overview of one of these techniques to give you some idea about like what these techniques might be doing. And uh, spoiler alert, they don't, at least this technique, uh, it doesn't do something very complex. It is like pretty intuitive and easy to understand. Right. So, OK, let's go back to our complex decision surface that I was explaining like a couple of slides back. So here the goal for us, as if you recall, uh, the goal for us is to kind of separate two classes, which is the blue region is one class and then the light pink region is this other class. Right. So those those are the two classes. Uh, our goal is to build a classifier that separates that. And let's say that we have a black box, which already is doing that. Right. And it's probably a deep neural net, which is very complex, which can model this kind of a decision surface, which is quite complex. So what this approach line does is, it, it, it is, by the way, a local approach, which means it only explains individual predictions. And how does it do that? What it does is very simple. So let's say we are now looking at this like bold plus marked red uh, point that you see on the screen. 
Uh, so it let's say that it, it focuses on that data point. And then it basically adds some noise to that data points, or what we call as perturbs that data point, right? So uh, take that bold red data point, add some noise, and create a bunch of other synthetic data points around it, right? So that's what you do. And then once you do that, you just train a linear model, like a linear regression or a logistic regression on that. Uh, where your class labels will now be the predictions of the black box, right? Instead of just being ground truth labels, uh, which we anyways may not have access to, the class labels when you build this logistic regression model or a linear regression model will be the labels or the predictions assigned by the black box to those synthetic data points. So that's it. So that's how it is building a local linear model, which is more interpretable than this deep neural net, which no one can understand what's going on with. Right. So that's pretty much it. Take a point, just add some noise to it and create a bunch of other synthetic points around it. Now fit a linear model, which can predict what the black box is actually doing. Right. That's it. So that's the approach. And why does this approach work? So this approach is based on some very nice intuition, which is even though a decision surface is kind of nonlinear and complex globally, for example, you can see all these kinds of you know, curvy decision surface on the left hand side. So even if it is that complex globally, when you look at it, at it, at it in its entirety, when you kind of focus on it locally, for example, if I just focus around this uh, bold red marked point here, you can see that the positively labeled points and negatively labeled points can still be separated by a linear model, right? So they are linearly separable. So that's the intuition that they try to exploit, right? So kind of zoom into the decision surface enough so that if you zoom into the decision surface enough, you will basically see regions where locally the model is being a linear, the uh, even the complex model is behaving like a linear model. And that's what they exploit to sort of construct these uh, explanations, which are pretty much logistic regressions and linear regressions. And of course, as we all know, those are interpretable because they give some notion of feature importances and that will help us understand how each feature is being used when making predictions uh, locally in this case right so this is the one of the first and like a very well known approaches uh, which facilitates explainability of complex uh, black boxes right so that's that's to give you a guy uh, give you a guys some uh, give you guys some introduction OK, so now with that said, let's move on to the next topic and again see some of the key problems there and challenges there and some initial solutions. So let's start looking at data biases. Again, the same question that we want to ask is why do we care about data biases, right? So ML algorithms rely pretty heavily on data. So if your data is biased in some way or the other, the algorithms trained on it will likely be biased too. And we'll talk a little bit about this notion of what exactly is bias and so on uh, in the coming few slides. But yeah, if your data is likely to be biased, then if you train an algorithm on that, it will also reflect those biases. For example, I'm sure a lot of you has, have seen this, that you know there is a very huge public outcry about the fact that commercial face recognition software it suffers from the problem that its accuracy is much lower on dark-skinned females compared to uh, white males and white females, right? So there's a severe problem there. Uh, so that could be thought of as one kind of bias being reflected from the data to the model. OK, so <clears throat> when I use the term data biases, what exactly do I mean? At a broad level, you can think of data biases or one broad sort of a connotation of data biases is a sample selection bias, which is kind of it broadly encompasses multiple things. And the idea with the sample selection bias is the training set is not a good representation of data in the real world, right? So whatever you used your model, used 
to train your model with that is not matching what the model will see in the real world once it is deployed, right? So again, like just kind of formalizing this, which means the join distribution P of X comma Y, where X is the set of independent variables or the features and Y is the outcome variable or the dependent variable. So that join distribution P X comma Y of the training data is not matching the distributions of the real world or the test data that it is actually being used on. Right. So that is, of course, very broad. So let's kind of see some, uh, you know, sort of like instantiations of this, some examples of how this could occur. So one simple thing that often happens is sample size disparity, which is, you know, one kind of a subset of a sample selection bias. Uh, so where the training data for the majority group is actually much smaller or, you know, you'll have much fewer samples coming from the minority group than those coming from the majority group. So, for example, the face recognition software, maybe they have a high skew in the data size where they have like 95% of their data is you know predominantly white and then uh, the rest of the 5% might be black that's why you might be seeing like low accuracy on uh, you know faces that of color right people of color um, so that could be like one example of or one instantiation of sample selection bias so another example is the skewed sample where, for example, if you think of like crime records, right, so where crimes are happening and so on, these crime records only come from those crimes that the police observe, right? And that itself might be biased because the police departments tend to dispatch more officers to a place that was historically found to have higher crime rates, right? And therefore, since you're sending more police to sort of, uh, you know, kind of look at those places, you're more likely to find crimes in those places again. Right. So and then again, that reinforces the bias that these places are crime prone and like this continues. So that kind of skewed samples are also pretty common in all these healthcare and you know criminal justice and law kinds of settings. Another example of a sample selection bias. And the last thing, I'm sure there are many more, but in our list of examples, the last thing that often happens is your environment is non-stationary. What do I mean by that? Though you have collected the perfect representative sample for your training data, maybe your environment or the setting in which your model is deployed is such that the data just changes temporally, like with time or even spatially. Like, for example, the data you know of patients in one hospital in LA might not be the same as or might not have a similar distribution as that of uh, the data of patients coming from a hospital in uh, Boston, right? So there might be changes in the data either temporally or spatially that your models will need to deal with. Right. So these are all the kinds of different biases that we need to be mindful of when designing and, of course, evaluating the machine learning models. OK, so with that said, now the next two topics, let's just see some of the consequences of these data biases. Uh, how can how can they cause unfairness and also what we call as blind spots in machine learning models? Uh, so. Let's get into the unfairness piece, right? So unfairness in machine learning is often a consequence of the biases in the data, because normally the goal for someone who is building a model is not to be adversarial and design a crappy model, which could also be the case. But in majority of the cases, these things creep in unintentionally. So one of the reasons why you see unfairness in machine learning is because of data biases. And there could be several other reasons, but one of the predominant reasons reasons is data biases, right? Uh, so, and why do we care about fairness? That's because machine learning models are being used to predict a lot of important things, like who should get a bail, who should get a loan, who should be hired, who should get healthcare subsidies, all these important decisions, right? And we want to make sure that in these kinds of critical decisions, there is no discrimination against minority subgroups. For example, maybe women or certain races, we want to make sure that the models are not discriminating against them when making such key decisions. OK, so one of the biggest challenges uh, in the fairness literature, which a lot of papers have now grappled with by now, and there are like several metrics, uh, the 
primary challenge here was how do we quantify fairness, right? And there are often like conflicting metrics that come up. And I'll give you some intuition about two of these metrics, right? Uh, so of course, this is clearly the first problem. We want to quantify or define fairness. Uh, just some notation for that. Let's say that we have a data set D, uh, which has like three key pieces, X, A, and Y. A is the sensitive feature. OK, so A is basically uh, whether someone belongs to a, you know, a gender female, whether someone is a female or not. Right. So that is A. So that's what we call as a sensitive attribute or the protected attribute. Or it could be race, right? African-American, white, Indian, Asian and so on. And X is all the other attributes which are not the sensitive attribute. And Y is, of course, the true label of you know the data points, right? And Y hat is the predicted label from a classifier. So this is just a basic notation. So for example, if we are thinking about a loan application as the decision problem, uh, Y indicates if an application actually applicant actually repaid a loan or not. So if if Y is one, then the applicant repaid a loan. Otherwise, the applicant did not repay a loan. So Y hat is the predicted label from a classifier. Uh, so with that said, one way in which people were trying to think about fairness is how about we just kind of exclude features like race and gender from the data and then build models on the data. As we can all see, that approach might fail very badly because there might be correlates, right? So even if I remove my race column from the data, there might be something like zip code, which anyways heavily correlates with race and kind of recreates the effect of race by default. So given that, this kind of an approach of just removing rows of, you know, or columns of race or gender or other sensitive attributes is not an effective strategy for achieving fairness. What about some other notions? Uh, one of the famous notions that people think about in the context of demographic parity is a classifier is fair if the acceptance rate is independent of the protected attribute. What do I mean by that? So the probability that your classifier will uh, accept someone, let's say, approve their loan or give them bail should be independent of what race they are from or what gender they are from. Right. So that's what you look for. And if a classifier satisfies this property, then it is said to be fair. Right. Um, so one challenge with this uh, metrics is that so it allows the predictive outcomes of unqualified individuals to be positive as long as acceptance rates is the same right so for example just to equalize these probabilities between two races or genders it might start giving loans to people who are not really qualified to get a loan that's one of the challenges with demographic parity and another challenge is if there is a perfect classifier, which is like 100% accurate, it disallows that if your protected attribute correlates with the outcome. This is, of course, a consequence of the previous challenge. Basically, a big problem with this is even just in the effort to like equalize these probabilities of approval for two races, you might start giving loans or approving people who are not exactly qualified. So that's one of the big challenges of demographic parity. So the other notion that is again very commonly used is equality of opportunity which says that conditioned on your positive outcomes like conditioned on y being one which means the fact that the person will actually pay the loan how or has paid the loan uh, the fraction of the data points for which the predictive uh, predicted outcome is positive should be roughly equal across both majority and minority groups, right? So it is, I guess, formalized in this equation, which means uh, basically the intuition here is that individuals who are capable of paying back their loans have equal opportunity of getting the loans across both the races or genders, right? So basically, it's also accounting. It's trying to fix one of the disadvantages of demographic parity that we just discussed and is also looking at someone's ability to pay a loan when saying when equalizing these probabilities of like giving loans to applicants. So that means uh, people who are capable of paying back their loans, they should have the same opportunity or same chance of getting a loan in the first place, no matter what race they are from or what gender they are from. Right. So that is what it's trying to do. 
However, one of the challenges that uh, folks argue about this kind of a metric is that uh, given the fact that some of the minority groups may already be behind when we start with, this notion might just kind of keep reinforcing that because it always expects people to have this highest quality bar. So it may not help close the gap between the two racial groups or gender groups in the long run. Right. So as you can see, these are kind of different conflicting notions. And in fact, there are there are some uh, theory which also shows that uh, not all notions of fairness are actually compatible. You can't achieve all at the same time. Achieving one means you're actually kind of downplaying the other and so on. So there is a lot of interesting work on that, too. But yeah, so just to give you a flavor, those are the different kinds of uh, notions of fairness that people are thinking about when trying to say how to quantify fairness. So now that we have seen some of these metrics, then how do we design machine learning models which are fair and how do we ensure the models that we have are actually fair, right? So to actually train a model that is fair, you can incorporate one or more of these above notions in the objective functions that we use to learn machine learning models. And of course, by now there is also a bunch of work which does this. And now if someone has given us a machine learning model to check if it is fair or not, we can just take the predictions of those models on some data sets and then compute the above notions to see if the uh, model is being fair or not. So that's how you kind of check or evaluate a model for fairness. Okay. So that brings us to our second kind of consequence of data biases, which is blind spots in ML, right? So this is, of course, another biggest downside of data biases. So what do I mean by blind spots is blind spots are those regions in the feature space where a model makes confident predictions but is incorrect. Right. So the regions where the model thinks it's doing extremely well and is acing all its predictions, but it is completely uh, you know, being terrible in making predictions in those regions. So why do they arise? They typically arise, or at least one of the main reasons they arise is due to the mismatch between the training and the test data distributions. So let me uh, give an example to show how these arise. Right. So let's say that we have this uh, classification task where you're trying to sort of uh, say if an image belongs to that of a dog or a cat. Uh, let's say our training data comprises of images which look like this. As you can see, all the dog images are somehow having a predominantly black color. All the cat images are having like a white or brown color in the image, right? So if such a training data is provided to your uh, learning algorithm, it might just pick up on color and say that, oh, if it is black, then like classify it as a dog. If it is you know, white or brown or any other color, then just classify it as a cat, right? So now if this kind of a model is deployed in a real world, and if a new image comes, which is actually a white colored puppy, the model with a very high confidence says it's a cat, right? So the confidence score is almost like 0.96 or so on. That's because your training data was so biased. So in this case, so these are examples of blind spots, right? So what the model is doing is it's saying I'm like 100, I'm like 96% confident there's a cat, but we know that it is making an error. So how to identify those kinds of regions of feature space where the model is making such errors is another very interesting problem. And just to give you like a quick intuition of how we could do this, as you can see, algorithms cannot self-start in this case and detect these blind spots because algorithm is thinking it is acing its predictions uh, you know, on all these kind of problematic images. So human input is very essential in these cases, right? So the approaches that we propose have to be some sort of human driven approaches where you try to strat strategically incentivize people to identify data points and their characteristics where the model is assigning high confidence labels, but is actually being wrong. So we need to kind of have a human in the loop approach for these kinds of uh, 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 tackling these kinds of problems. And there is like some interesting work in this area, but there is also scope to do a lot more here. OK, so with that, we have sort of concluded the data biases and their consequences piece of the talk. And now coming to the last piece, and I promise I'll be uh, quick, so which is the missing counterfactuals. So to understand this problem, let me just give you a quick example of a bail decision problem. Uh, the US police, I'm talking about US in this case, they make about 12 million errors each year. So each defendant appears in front of a judge, and the judge either releases or detains the defendant, right? So 
of course, I'm kind of simplifying this problem because normally a judge sets a bail in some dollar amount and then the defendant, if he can pay the bail, then the defendant gets out or not. That happens in some cases and in other cases, the judge just like releases the person or says, no matter how much money you pay, we can't let you go and detains them. But just for the sake of simplicity for this uh, talk, we are only considering the binary decision where the judge is either releasing someone or detaining someone. And this is an important decision because if you get detained, you will have to spend about 9 to 12 months in jail, which is a long enough time that you might lose your job, your family might have you know, financial problems if you know, uh, someone is actually, someone in the family is detained for so long and so on. OK, so now let's look at some of the deeper aspects of this decision problem. So let's say someone is released on bail by the judge. This person might potentially go out and might commit new crimes when he or she is outside, right? Or this person might be on the best behavior and do none of the above, which is what we would hope for. Ideally, we would want to release people who will not cause any further problems once they are released on bail. Now, the second side of this decision is someone is denied bail and detained, which means this person can't go outside. So the person will just spend time in jail for 9 to 12 months. And the problem that we need to see here is that we do not observe what if the defendant who has been detained what that person would have done had he or she been released on bail, right? So we do not observe the counterfactual scenario, the what if scenario for people who are detained. So basically, we don't know what would have happened had I released this guy who the judge has detained, right? So what would he have done, like whether he would commit new crimes if he was released or not, we'll never, we'll not be able to see that. And, and this is actually a lot of the kind of data that we see in healthcare and criminal justice we don't see the counterfactuals we only see the decision of the human decision maker like the judge or a doctor and then the consequence of that we don't see oh what if the judge would have done something differently what would have happened we have no clue right and we need to train models and evaluate them on this kind of data so what do we do right so some of the approaches uh, which try to tackle this problem basically do this which is let's just ignore all the uh, cases or the defendants or the data points in the data for which we don't have labels basically let's just ignore all the people who are detained and let's just train our models and evaluate our models only on the people that we have labels for which are the release defendants right but there is one major problem with that which is the release defendants do not constitute a random sample, right? So it's not like the judge is actually releasing people randomly, in which case we can just like take one part of the random sample and, you know, do our analysis, right? So the judge is also carefully thinking about who he or she should release and then only jailing some people and releasing some. So if you're only because you're creating a biased classifier and you're also, if you evaluate on such data, you're also creating an incorrect evaluation. So that's the problem with just completely ignoring these unlabeled uh, data points which correspond to detained defendants. So this is, in fact, a challenging problem uh, with no free lunches or easy solutions. So one key thing that makes this problem challenging in these settings is it is unethical to obtain random samples in these settings. For example, it's unethical for a judge to say, oh, let me just release this defendant just randomly just for the sake of it so that I get more data points for my ML model, right? And then the next thing you know, that person goes out and creates a havoc in the world. So it is impossible to uh, get random samples in these kinds of situations. So that's why this problem is so challenging in these settings like law and criminal justice and healthcare. And it has no easy solution. So this is actually a very open space with lots of interesting problems and exciting uh, solutions that are just waiting to come about. So let me leave you guys with like one simple intuition uh, that works for this particular setting, the bail setting that we have talked about. So each judge actually sees a random sample of defendants. That's because when someone comes to bail, they're not being consciously assigned to, oh, because you have certain characteristics, you go to this judge but they're sort of just like randomly assigned to oh you have come up for bail just go to this judge and like you know they're kind of randomly assigned to judges so each judge in a lot of jurisdictions sees a random sample of defendants 
Now, if we have a judge who is super lenient and releases either all of or most of the defendants that he sees, then he is giving us a, a random sample that is fully labeled. Right? In this case, the judge is seeing the random sample. He is somehow being super lenient and releasing everyone. Of course, that judge is probably making mistakes in um, his decision making. That's another issue to fix. But at least in the historical data, if someone has done that, you will get an almost most labeled random sample, which you can then use to train and evaluate your machine learning model. But of course, this is more of like an econometric or an experimental trick rather than being a foolproof solution to this problem. But you know, this is a challenging problem to tackle. OK, so with that, I think uh, we are almost a little over time. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for your patience. And thanks for listening. Hope you guys took away something from this talk. And I'm happy to answer any questions or address any other comments. Thank you so much. So thank you, Professor Hima, for this interesting talk. And I hope moving forward, everyone thinks about sort of interpretable and explainable machine learning. So we have a way. Uh, a bit of questions. So I'll just read out the question to you. Yeah. So the first question asks that fairness in machine learning is a fairly new topic. Yeah. You explain it in the context of sensitive application areas such as banking or finance. Yeah. But uh, should we also be worried in standard machine learning problems such as object detection, natural language processing, or healthcare? Because bias is a big problem in these said areas, even yeah. with benchmark models and data sets. Right. Yeah. No, that is very true. And I think just to highlight the magnitude of the problem, I talked about you know law and healthcare, right? Because there you can clearly see a person's you know life being impacted, their health being impacted, and so on. But yeah, I mean this problem exists in pretty much every other setting as well, like ranging from you know friendship recommendations on Facebook to uh, you know image searches on Google and like you know depending on what you are using these things for maybe the stakes are low like for example if your friend recommendation is biased you may be like yeah well okay i can move on right but if someone is kind of getting jailed for this reason then you are like okay that is i can't move on from that that's a problem that needs to be addressed so yes they exist everywhere uh, the fairness or the biases problems i just used some settings to highlight their importance more prominently yeah. okay thank you so our next question is, what are some real world domains like health or law where deep learning has been applied, but explainable AI hasn't been explored? Yeah, that's a good question. So law is actually much more nascent. So deep learning is, I mean, it has not been deployed for sure. Like I'm like, I would be very surprised if it has been because I know the US court systems a bit more and I've been collaborating with some. Uh, the technology there is nowhere close to like getting a deep learning model into the courts anytime soon. Uh, but in healthcare, people have been using like some of these deep learning models, especially in radiology and like for uh, you know analyzing CT scans and that kind of stuff. Uh, though I don't think the explainable AI part is still very prominently done there. So it is. I mean, even the deep learning is also kind of like just kicking up in the last couple of years. So explainability is still not exactly like, yeah, just kind of there everywhere. And it has been embedded. That's not been done. So I think healthcare is probably the domain that you're looking for. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is, can confidence aware learning be used yeah. to improve high stake decisions? Sorry, uh, you broke off a bit. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll repeat. So can confidence-aware learning be used yeah. to improve high-stake decisions? Right. So I think you're talking about things like these Bayesian neural nets and that kind of stuff, which also have uncertainty estimates on the model predictions and so on. I mean, yes, definitely. Like, yeah, that is definitely one way to sort of think about, uh, uh, you know, like having more of the uncertainty estimates on your predictions and so on is very useful in high stakes decision making. There is no doubt about that. But even that might be thrown off if your data has biases. Like we just talked about the blind spots in the talk, right? 
So if your data is in a certain way, even the confidence estimates that you sort of get are probably not going to be the actual true estimates that would correspond to like the real world distributions, right? So your estimates also could be biased. So these problems still will be there, whether you train a confidence aware kind of a model like a Bayesian neural net or something which still gives uncertainty estimates, or if you train something else. So like, yeah, that is one step up. It's definitely helpful. But I think the underlying biases would still stay if your data is biased, for example. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, so our next question is, you talked about explainability in deep learning is a fairly tough task. So what are your views on explainability for uh, models like GPT-3, which have a lot of parameters? Yeah. So uh, explainability for text is like in general more challenging than explainability for say tabular data. Uh, so there are some approaches. So in fact, like one way I see, I think, uh, Rezina Barzile has some papers on this and so on. But like when sort of constructing these models itself, if you can put a component in the model that is uh, sort of emitting some interpretable aspects, right? Like maybe like let's say a few words in a sentence or like in a document are being used to determine maybe the sentiment of a, of a particular document in text. So like kind of already spitting out those words when the model is kind of learning this, those kinds of stuff would be probably super helpful uh, if we can do that without even getting to post hoc explanations, which means like you have the model completely done and then you are explaining it. So kind of thinking about this when designing these algorithms itself would be useful. Post hoc explanations for text, you can potentially use some of the uh, like line, for example, that I explained, you can potentially use some of those things, but then how accurate they would be is like another, you know, like uh, another question altogether. But yes, I mean, there is already some work on explainability and interpretability, but I think there's a lot more to be done in the context of text. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So moving on. So our next question is, can, so Partha asks, can I say blind spots in machine learning models are false positive rate? Yes. I mean, you, well, yes, you could say that. Yes. Yeah. The, the goal is to basically, when you think of a blind spot, you are thinking of regions of feature space. I mean, it is related to this, but like you can, you are thinking of what is like, can you describe this particular region in the feature space? where these errors are happening right so that is what so you are kind of like think of it as like maybe false positive feature subspaces is what you're trying to identify and that's what you're sort of calling as a blind spot so yeah okay thank you so uh next question is so do we have any explainable clustering techniques that are already used in road safety issues in road safety issues, like self-driving, you mean that kind of road safety? I, I think so. OK. Yeah, not that I am aware of. I think, uh, yes, like I think it's a very, like, well, there are some, recently I've seen a couple of papers. Uh, they're using what is called as like saliency map techniques, which are also another kind of explainability technique that people have proposed in the literature. So they were sort of using that uh, in the context of autonomous driving, but again, not like a whole, like, there is no like, you know, set of 100 papers or something. It's like fairly nascent again. So yeah. Okay. So uh, moving on. So we have two more questions. So is it fine or do you have a meeting to catch? Oh, yeah. No, no. Go ahead. I'm okay. Free now. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. OK, so uh, just to add to the previous question, so Tripti says, uh, not I think not self-driving cars, but accidents and other traffic safety issues. Right. Uh, so yeah, not that I'm aware of. In fact, if anything, people are hoping that these kinds of explainable AI tools in the context of autonomous driving could potentially help avert accidents. That's why I sort of brought that up. But without self-driving cars in the picture and just like, you know, using some explainable AI for like even human driving and, you know, averting accidents and so on, I think that's a much less explored area, right? So like, I don't think there are like any uh, specific like works or something that I'm aware of. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. So our next question is, 
generally modal attributions are used to explain how important neurons are for predicting an output yeah. but uh, how does one go about extending this to give a better summarized explanation of the model maybe can we use attributions to generate adversaries yeah no so actually i mean like lime is one thing that we talked about which is one explainable technique so that is also giving feature attributions right so you can attributions are good the only problem is you need to have some interpretations of the features on which you have attributions like if you give me a random activation node that's a very complicated function that i don't know what it means then if you give me an attribution on that that's not useful for like a judge right like if you say oh this node is like 20.5 into feature 1 plus 30.2 into feature 2 plus like something something and its attribution is like 10 he's like okay i don't know what to think of it anymore and i mean even i don't know what to think of it anymore forget the judge right so th that's why the important piece here is attributions are great of course they are helpful to see what's going on the problem is can you make the pieces before that more interpretable right so can you give some abstractions or descriptions to the activation node themselves right so maybe those nodes correspond to certain kinds of examples which have certain features then it becomes interpretable to have an attribution on top of it and i think most explainability literature is just trying to solve that problem pretty much so yeah yeah thank you so sure. um could there be conflicts in law which could require fine criteria to discriminate between conditions Uh, sorry uh, uh, i i'll read the question again so yeah. wouldn't there be any conflicts in law which could uh, require quite fine criteria to discriminate between conditions uh so i'm assuming the question is trying to get it like you will need more nuanced thinking than what models can do um is that roughly like what the question is i think so uh, okay Yeah so i mean yes that is definitely possible in fact uh, like if you think of trial decisions right so what i talked about today is bail and just to give you some context like in the us the bail decisions are made within like 3 minutes so someone comes in it's not like there's a lawyer arguing on their behalf a defendant comes in the judge looks at their file looks at all their characteristics and says okay either you get a bail or this amount or you don't get a bail and so on so that is a kind of a decision which is already lending itself to automation because in, instead of a judge looking at a file some algorithm can as well look at that same data and like help with the prediction right but when you think of a trial decision like is someone you know like guilty of committing a violent crime let's say right so in that case the defendant will have a prosecutor who will defend on his behalf then there is you know the other side who argues against the defendant there are detailed arguments uh, which go on for like days and weeks and months sometime and then you know the decision comes about so that is clearly a way more nuanced decision than the bail one that we are talking about right and we are not at a point where we could sort of try i mean maybe we could try and assist with sort of coming up with cases that had a similar flavor or something by analyzing text but we are nowhere close to saying oh in trial decisions we'll come up with these predictions that say oh yes this person is guilty with 90% probability or no because they are like way more nuanced than uh, what like machine learning models are typically meant for so yeah that is one example of like a more nuanced decision where ml is clearly not ready okay. thank you so uh, i think we would have one last question so partha asks can you uh, provide some papers uh, in this area yeah. uh, do you have any specific resources in mind for this area that's a great question actually uh, yes and in fact like in a couple of days or like maybe a little longer we'll be launching something with resources for all of these topics and i can send that link to one of you people and maybe you can share that with all the participants uh so currently of course like there is you know the slide i'm sharing has like all the resources for the explainability and interpretive not all but you know some of the more fundamental work on that area 
so that that is kind of exhaustively there in that link, uh, which was actually a course I did last quarter. But we are trying to pull in resources like this for like fairness and uh, other topics that we had uh, too. But one good starting point is all the topics that I discussed today. Uh, these are there in like these are touched upon by some of my papers and clearly those papers refer other fundamental work so i could just like provide a couple of things i think interpretability and explainability you guys already see the link online um let me uh show the missing counterfactuals problem i will just share links can i share the links in this chat yeah yeah you can share the links in the chat okay so that's for the missing counterfactuals problem uh, that's also for the missing counterfactuals problem and uh, blind spots problem. So this is for the blind spots problem. And then for the fairness stuff, I'll share work by Moritz Hart, which has more references. So for fairness, you could potentially look at this book, which is, I think, partly being done. Uh, and then there is a course which has a lot of good references. Yeah. So I think these things should like help you point back to other references and so on. Yeah. OK, thank you. So I guess, Partha, you can also follow Professor Hema on Twitter. So I think, uh, are you active on Twitter? For that matter yes that is an icml paper that we have i think i just see partha mentioning on the chat yeah so that's about like robust and stable black box explanation so that's like the recent icml paper that's right oh actually you know what i want to give this one so more than my page i mean yes of course you guys are welcome to follow me but uh, so this is another Twitter handle that me and some of my collaborators have started, which will post all the latest work on trustworthy ML areas. Uh, so we are like trying to curate it very well, and every day we are posting something. In fact, one of the main goals of this page, of course, was to keep people up to date with all the latest happenings in this field, uh, but also to give preference to the work of people uh, who are who don't have the access like they don't have a Twitter following of some XK followers or you know they are coming from other countries other than US where like often it gets harder for people to know about their work and so on. So one of the goals of this handle is also to publicize the work of young researchers from different countries and places. So like feel free to tweet at that handle uh, if you want your work to be discussed there and so on. OK, thank you. So I think that ends our questions. So thank you so much for being here and giving your talk. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hope this was useful. Yeah. Have a good day. Do. Bye. Bye. Oh, are we offline now? No, I think we are still live. So uh, just for the participants, so we will now have a conclusion session. And you will all, uh, all automatically transition to the next session.